Hi, I'm Jim O'Shaughnessy, and welcome to Infinite Loops. Sometimes we get caught up in what feel like infinite loops when trying to figure things out. Markets go up and down, research is presented and then refuted, and we find ourselves right back where we started. The goal of this podcast is to learn how we can reset our thinking on issues that hopefully leaves us with a better understanding as to why we think the way we think and how we might be able to change that to avoid going in infinite loops of thought. We hope to offer our listeners a fresh perspective on a variety of issues and look at them through a multifaceted lens, including history, philosophy, art, science, linguistics, and yes, also through quantitative analysis. And through these discussions, help you not only become a better investor, but also become a more nuanced thinker. With each episode, we hope to bring you along with us as we learn together. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode of Infinite Loops. Jim O'Shaughnessy is chairman and co-chief investment officer of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, where Jamie Catherwood is an associate. All opinions expressed by Jim, Jamie, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with my colleague Vatzel with another episode of Infinite Loops. And today I have a very, very special guest who really does know how to mix it up. Mr. Chris Williamson, who is the proprietor of the Modern Wisdom podcast, who we are going to put our begging bowl out and ask you for some of the guests that you've got, because your guests are amazing. One of the things I love about you, Chris, is you are just totally out there. So in your bio, it's ex-party boy. That relates to your another business of yours that we're going to talk about later. But you put up a quote today, which I really thought was kind of fun. And it was, every liberal is just a conservative who hasn't grown up yet. (laughs) And that reminded me of our earlier conversation of the Churchillian drift, where you get a ton of quotes being attributed to people who never, ever said them. The one that I thought of Churchill was reported to have said, a liberal who is 25, if you're not a liberal when you're 25, you have no heart. If you're not a conservative when you're 35, you have no head. Opine. And welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here, man. I'm looking forward to this. Not everything that I tweet is meant to be taken seriously. I think that's the main lesson to take from that tweet. Sometimes I just post things to see what the reaction is going to be. Part of it is true. I mean, Young people like the idea of high income taxes because they don't have any income to tax. Their openness, your openness as a personality trait decreases over time. Like, why do you think that your granddad loves to go to the same pub on the same night of the week and order the same fish and chips or whatever it is that Americans eat? Why do you think that they do that? Well, it's because as you get deeper and deeper into your life, you ingrain yourself in habits. You become a little bit less open. I think sometimes people take things on Twitter far too seriously, even when they don't warrant it. One of the replies was massive overgeneralization, as if that's some sort of world-breaking insight. Of course, do you really think that I didn't mean, that I meant like every single liberal is going to turn into a conservative? Like, obviously not. But Twitter is an interesting place, especially when you start poking the bear. It really is. And as you know, I do that occasionally just to generate data, honestly. I have a friend who I don't know who it is yet, and I want to figure out who it is because I know that it is someone who knows me really well because he tweeted something like, if anyone on this app thinks that we're nothing but lab rats to Jim, you got to rethink that. (laughs) And I'm like, who are you? Here's something I've got in my head, man. So you know when you watch UFC fighters? And they'll have their lead hand and they'll have that lead hand and they'll just be range finding with that lead hand. They're not throwing anything. They're just checking the distance from them to their opponent or just to the other person. It doesn't have to be an opponent. I think that's what a lot of tweets are. They're just helping you to map your location in the cultural ether, so to speak. And it seems like you definitely do that. I mean, Jack does this as well, right? He puts provocatively concise tweets out at things that are probably 
more simplified than they need to be to see what happens. All right, can people actually understand layer one, layer two, layer three of this? I think me and you maybe just troll a bit harder than that. Obviously, one of my big things, as you know, is that people are, first off, they're prematurely certain way too fast. It's dangerous to understand new things too quickly. In my, I'm stealing that quote, by the way. I can't remember who said it. But it brings us back to the Churchillian drift, where everything now, maybe 20 years from now, everything will be attributed to either Churchill, Hemingway, Oscar Wilde, Plato, or hopefully Banksy. <laughs> but they become prematurely certain. They bind that to their sense of self. And then questioning an idea becomes an attack on self. What do you think about that? Collapse of grand narratives, man. Like what else have people got to attach themselves to now other than the beliefs that they created themselves? We're detached from the local area that we have. We're detached from sense of patriotism. Even that, one of the most fundamental elements of where were you born? What was the country you grew up in? You have some sort of loyalty to the state. Even that's being disintegrated at the moment. I saw this tweet earlier on today literally just before I came on, and it said, the loss of faith in our institutions is the number one risk to the 21st century, and there's nothing that anyone can do about it. If anybody has managed to emerge from the last 16 months with their faith in higher powers still intact, CDC, WHO, governments, policymakers, I would be amazed. You have to have basically not read or seen anything. What does that mean? That means that all of the previous way markers that people would have grabbed onto something concrete, that's gone. There is nothing fundamental for people to hold onto anymore. And that sounds great. You can be whatever you want to be. This is a meritocracy. We're in a capitalist society. You can go from lower class, underclass, right all the way to upper class in the space of no time at all. There's unbelievable internet money out there. You can jack butcher your way to a Naval startup or whatever it might be. But when you deconstruct some of the cultural artifices that we were holding on to, there's nothing robust left. You need some stakes in the ground. This is why conservatism needs to stay. I don't lean particularly right or left, but I think that there's a Donald Kingsbury quote that says, tradition is a set of solutions for which we have forgotten the problems. And that really does highlight, like throw, dispense with things that have been carefully crafted over thousands of years at your peril. Why would you get rid of this stuff so flagrantly? It doesn't surprise me that people find faith in their own worldview, because what else have you got left to have faith in? That kind of fits perfectly into a snippet I pulled from a book I'm reading called The Fifth Science. I want to read it to you and get your reaction. It's science fiction. And so this is assuming that humans have colonized the galaxy. And here's the passage. We call it narrative collapse. When a planet is connected, a time inevitably arrives when it becomes difficult to work out what is actually going on. Video and audio can be faked. Testimony isn't reliable. All truths fail into a relative flatness. This is more dangerous than any doomsday weapon. Well, it is because what have people got left to ground their certainty in? Why do we have eyes? We have eyes to be able to judge how far we are from the next thing. If our eyes were no longer reliable visual indicators of what was going on, we might as well have our eyes closed. Or in fact, it would probably be better for us to have our eyes closed. I would rather not know where the car is and be able to use my other senses than think I know where the car is and get it wrong. I think that what's going on right now is going to change literally everything. It's gonna change education. It's gonna change the nature of work. It's gonna change the nature of how people have to think. I think we're moving into a time when your ability to synthesize Knowledge and information is going to be vastly more important. Your ability to be nonlinear in your thought is going to be vastly more important. And I recognize that really for the first time, there's going to be a group of people who through no fault of their own are going to have a harder time coming up to speed with that. And so as we advance again, rational optimists, I think that will help make things a lot smoother. Thoughts? Have you spent any time looking at behavioral genetics at all? I have, yes. Anyone that's looked at that knows that an unbelievable amount of all of the things that you value in yourself and in others, you didn't choose. It's essentially the same as luck because it came from your parents. So your IQ 
correlates with your parents by 0.8 toward the end of adulthood. It actually seems to converge as opposed to diverge as you get older, which is quite interesting. So you can have an incredibly thick or clever child, but by the end of life, they're not far off where you are. I remember seeing this meme, man, and it's this dude, this really sort of like good looking, broad shouldered guy stood at the front of a bed, bath and beyond. And he's got a shirt and a tie on and there's a thought bubble coming out the side of his head. And he said, 500 years ago, I would have been a proud warrior. It's purely by a quirk of this particular version of the simulation that cognitive horsepower is what's applauded at the moment. And you're totally right that you're going to get a Matthew principle here. You're going to have from those who have nothing, more will be taken. And from those who have everything, more will be given. Because there's a rule at the moment, I think it's if you have an IQ below 85, you can't join the armed forces or maybe 95 or something like that. You can just imagine that as the lower bound for the skill level, the intellectual competency level that you need continues to rise and rise and rise, that IQ level is just going to go up with it. And it's not just going to be for being in the army now, because why would a place of work decide to let go of the robot that can do it at 99.99999% failure rate, almost no errors at all, to let some human in that's going to mess it all up. I haven't really looked into the economics of how this stuff would work morally. I don't really have too much of a problem with it. My interest is human motivation and human nature. So I think the main challenge you would have is giving people a sense of purpose. If you strip away from them that job, for a lot of people, that is the reason that they get up in the morning. I mean, people that retire at 55 die at 65. That's what happens. You retire early. My dad's trying to retire early and I'm going like, oh, maybe just semi-retirement for a bit or have you considered starting an allotment or do you want to get another five dogs or something? Or maybe we should begin a business doing whatever. Just because I know that that's the thing that will keep you going. So yes, it would be great. It will support people that through no fault of their own don't have the competencies that can allow them to continue contributing to the workforce in a meaningful way. It means that companies don't need to have these weird sort of throwaway jobs that everybody knows is kind of just like a hall pass type thing that it would be so disgusting to have. You'd feel like such a loser to have that job and everybody would know. It's like bringing your really unfit mate along to football just so he doesn't get left out when you were a kid. The main challenge I think is how do you give these people a sense of purpose? How do you give someone that isn't a part of the workforce a reason to get up in the morning when they don't have to get up in the morning? When you were talking about the minimum IQ for the armed services, I flashed on something that I read, which I found very intriguing, which is for a long time in the US, if you had an IQ above, I think it was 125 or 130, you could not work for the police. I've seen this article from 1997. I was going to bring it up. Because people who are brighter don't take orders very well. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was really, really fascinating from the point of view of, it was the first time I'd ever seen a ceiling on IQ. One other thing on IQ, why do you think it's so controversial? People don't like the idea that there is an immutable truth that you are bestowed at the beginning of life that determines your path through life. That's all it is. That if IQ is relatively unmalleable, which based on the fact that it's 0.8 correlated with your parents toward the end of life, it seems so. You've got 20% to play around. That's not nothing, but it's not everything either. And academic competency is what's applauded in the modern world. But you've given people, I learned this from Alain de Botton from the School of Life. He says that if the people who achieve their successes at the top and their victories are worthy of their successes, what does that make the people that don't? And he talks about the lexical change that we saw from the unfortunates. Lady Fortuna had not blessed these ancient Greeks, the beggars on the street, the people that were born with one leg or with some sort of challenges. Roll the clock forward now. What's the equivalent? It's a loser. It's not an unfortunate. It's a loser. It's a person who has, through their own volition, somehow not made it happen. And the problem with the meritocracy is that it puts your success or your failure at your feet, which is great if you achieve successes, but it sucks if you don't. And people with compassion don't like the idea that, and rightly so, it makes me feel uncomfortable that you can have someone, it feels unfair. But then I remember my parents telling me when I couldn't watch TV after, when I was 11 years old, couldn't watch TV after nine o'clock and I was stomping up the stairs and they'd shout after me and I'd say, this is so unfair. And they'd just scream after me and go, life's unfair. And I thought, well, 
I guess it's not very gracious, but it is kind of true. Here's another one, man. Like imagine if we could get a quantified metric. We kind of can with a big five personality, but imagine you could get a quantified metric for hard workism or willpower or conscientiousness, I guess you could call it like industriousness. If you had that number, that correlates very, very closely with success in life as well. The willpower test that they did, the marshmallow test, correlated more closely than net worth and than IQ. Now, you can say that there's different types of intelligence and so on and so forth. But if there was WQ or something like willpower, the willpower quotation, people were able to see that and you were born with really low willpower, you think, well, God, this is really unfair. But it's just the fact that IQ has kind of been applauded. It's sort of the biggest goose in the nest to shoot, so to speak. Like it's the obvious one that everybody goes after. But there's a whole bunch of other things. I get injured quite easily and I adore training physically. I tend to have one sort of physical ailment that I'm rehabbing at one time just before I get another one in time for this one to be fixed. So should I be upset about that? Well, the difference is that my physical fitness isn't fundamental to my ability to create a sense of purpose, social status, resources within society. If everybody was a hunter gatherer or if everyone made the money by playing football or something, then it would be very difficult for me, but it's not. So it's so central to our success in life. If you don't get it, you feel very down. People that see people that don't get it and they feel empathy toward them. And there's very little that anyone can really do about this. So all of that combined, it makes sense that it's an uncomfortable situation. One of the things that I love about listening to your podcasts and everything, A, you've got great guests and we're going to try to Shanghai some of them. You ask questions in a manner, at least to my ear, that is a learning system that's kind of grabbing. One of the things I actually wanted to talk to you about was what are the five learnings that you came away after chatting with some of your guests that you didn't have before, but equally as important to me at least, is are there others that you deleted after listening to your guests? One that certainly comes to mind was Aubrey Marcus, and this was a couple of years ago. He's coming back on the show soon. So Aubrey's the CEO of Onnit, business partner with Joe Rogan, so on and so forth. Very smart guy, very psychedelic, big into his wavy drugs and his long baggy pants and stuff, lives in Austin but very, very awakened guy in the best sense of the word. He taught me that the persona is incapable of receiving love. It can only receive praise. What he means by that is if you play a role, any successes that you get will feel hollow because people aren't in love with you. They're just applauding the role that you play. And this formed the basis of my TEDx talk. And it's very, very, very insightful. As someone that had played a role for a long time, as a young guy that had attached his sense of self-meaning to the success of his business, to the amount of social renown I had, going on reality TV shows all over the place and a blue tick on Twitter and free charcoal toothpaste and all this sort of stuff. I realized that what I'd desperately been trying to do was please other people. I wanted to do things that I thought other people would find funny or entertaining or worthy of respect or popularity or whatever it might be. And that had caused me to constantly be playing a persona. And this is why I never felt love. This is why when someone went into one of my nightclubs, they never came out. Well, this might, there might be a couple of reasons for this, but nobody ever went into one of my events and came out and said to me, hey man, before I went in there, I was lost and alone, didn't really understand myself. And I thought no one in the world got me. But dude, when I heard that banging house music and I had those one pound Jaeger bombs, man, like it just, dude, you've changed my life, man. But now I get messages like that all the time with the show. And it fulfills me in a way it's like being thirsty without knowing that you're thirsty and then taking your first drink. That's the same level of sort of existential quenching that I get from it. This is what happens when you find something that you genuinely care about and you contribute to the world and you think, right, I genuinely believe that I'm leaving this place better than I found it because of this. And that persona thing, you know, we don't love Hugh Jackman. We love Wolverine. We don't love Chris Hemsworth. We love Thor. And this was a reason why after reflecting on that quote from Aubrey, the persona is incapable of receiving love. It can only receive praise. I think you see a lot of actor suicides because they spend all of their life playing personas and they don't really know who they are anymore. They struggle to separate themselves from the role. Is it me that people love? Is it the script? Is it the writer? Oh, it's just too much. That was a huge one. That is amazing. It gets us into the fictional character known as Jed McKinna territory. You force fed him into my eyes. 
fucking front end of the Jed McKenna funnel here. You will read Jed McKenna, <laughs> even though he's a complete fiction, which is so meta that I love it. It illustrates so many things. So just quickly, Jed McKenna says, we're all fictional characters and we're all playing a persona. And that's one of the main problems in the world. And to wake up, you need to realize that. I am saying this as a fully unawake person. Let's get that clear. But I love that quote because I think there's so much truth in it. One of the things that I always kind of struggle with is are people afraid to show their true self? What do you think? This is the topic of my TEDx talk about embracing your weirdness, that the vast majority of people are terrified of showing their true selves. They think that it's the thing that's going to get them sacked or make them single for the rest of their life or make them never be able to connect with another human. And the bar stool has been completely turned upside down by them. If you ask anyone, why did you fall in love with your partner? No one has ever said, do you know what it is? I just adore how easily replaceable they are. The fact that they're so bl they've got this sort of beautiful blend of vanilla and bland views. I'm very turned on by how predictable everything is that they say. I know one thing about them and I can accurately represent everything else they're going to come out with. Like, no one's ever said that. No, we fall in love with people for their idiosyncrasies and for their quirks. But we have the fear, and I think this is born out of the schoolyard, that we map a schoolyard popularity dynamic onto the real world and we presume that it still works. Because being different in school really isn't very highly valued. It's like the most limbic place in the world. It's just sort of these little bloop, 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 bloop machines totting around. But it can also be very vicious and it informs the way that we behave in later life. The same goes for business. You trying to do what everybody else does guarantees you average results. That's the one way that you can guarantee average. In fact, if you try and do what everyone else does and that's not what you do, you're probably going to be worse than average because you can't even do that. Just do what you do. This is the Naval quote. No one can beat you at being you. But it's fear, man, and it makes sense. I understand why people are scared. Like, again, this is me speaking as someone that's always terrified, like concerned about whether or not it's the right thing. There's still a huge artifact of old Chris looming in the background behind me. But when you get rid of them, it's a very liberating way to live. And learning stuff like that. Another one that Aubrey said, he said, you do not serve people from your cup. You serve them from the saucer that overflows around your cup which is sort your shit first before you try and go fix the world, which is a Jordan Petersonism. But it's a little bit more than that as well. It's the fact that, look, you can benefit other people by sorting yourself, not just that you sort yourself, then get after the world. And this is another Navalism, I think, where he says that you can't make other people be happy. You can be happy yourself and other people will be happy because of it. So that overflowing cup analogy and the persona and the loved one, that episode really blew me away. Those are all great. Obviously, I'm a big fan of that way of looking at the world. I was lucky in that I realized pretty early on that other people weren't thinking about me at all. <laughs> and so that is very, very liberating and helpful. Tony DeMello is another guy who I've read extensively. This is also his message. You got to change yourself first. And a lot of people don't like that. And again, back to Jed McKenna, he, he goes, basically, we are fear-based creatures and everything starts from fear. If you can get, if you're a Dune fan, which I can't wait for the new movie and I know I'll be disappointed because I'm so excited about it. But if you're a Dune fan, there's a big theme there and in literature as well. That kind of brings me to the idea of, is there a process? where you synthesize and then add to knowledge base. But again, I want to get you to tell me something you deleted from the knowledge base. I'll do the deletion first, because this is quite an interesting one. So it's Jordan Peterson, and I didn't get to bring it up with him on the show, which is a shame, but I learned it from him. It's such a stupid, but I found it really profound insight, given my background as a club promoter and a party boy. It was be attractive to many women, but choose just one. And for me, it had always been be attractive to many women and choose all of them. <laughs> okay. That was my pathway for success, my club promoter. That's my clout. That's my social status, especially where I come from. And I talk about sobriety a lot as well, because I used it as a productivity tool very frequently. I do blocks of sobriety because it means that I get focused. I don't go out late on a night. 
And to some people, that seems so obvious. Like, the obvious, mate. Like, yeah, you shouldn't drink when you do that. And I'm like, mm, you're not from a working class town in the northeast of the UK, the last town before Scotland. This is the culture here. This is the biggest red pill that you can take. It's complete deprogramming because this is what people live for. Thursday night, light one, Friday night, heavy one, Saturday night, heavy one, Sunday, recover, Monday, go back to work. That's the routine. And then the same thing goes for being a young guy, that if you were the one that was sleeping with the most girls or with the hottest chick or breaking the most hearts, stuff like that, that was applauded. But it always made me feel a bit icky and I didn't really understand why. And I'd been a bit of a shit boyfriend for quite a while. And I actually realized this doesn't make me feel proud of myself at all. And regardless of how nice the relationship is for the other person, even if I cast that aside, which I wasn't, I had so much more fulfillment and self-respect by being a good partner or by just not being a shit, just not being a little shit to these girls. And that completely upended everything. The hero in the story doesn't go around each of the different castles, leaving the maidens bedspreads in the morning. He goes through fire and brimstone. Maybe tons of maidens want him, but he chooses one. And I thought that was a really good antidote to a lot of the unwritten cultural programming that I'd been given as a young guy about what I should do. That's really interesting. And in literature, of course, prima nocture, where the king goes and sleeps with the bride-to-be before her husband, is seen as pure evil. You brought up a point that I've spoken. So our designer, our interior designer, is from working class Britain. She's quite beautiful. Her husband's totally switched on. He's an ad guy. He's run agencies all around the world. And we were at dinner with them one night and maybe a little too much wine. But by the way, I do the whole not drinking for long periods of time as well. It's just such an easy and good thing to do. Anyway, she was like, I got to tell you something. I'm like, what? And she's like, if we were in the UK, you would never hire me. And I'm like, what? Why? You're incredibly talented. And she asserted that even though no one really talks about it, the class system is very much alive in the UK. And that someone in my position, I wouldn't even have any exposure to her. Number one, is that true? Are you finding that that's also true? And how do you change it? I think that you wouldn't be aware of her existence. It's very deeply ingrained. The difference between the UK and the US. In the US, the problem that you guys have is that everybody believes they can be anything that they want to be, which leads to you having too many school shooters and too many people that have huge out of control egos because there's no one to bring them back down to earth. In the UK, we have the opposite problem. We have tall poppy syndrome. We have, what do you think you're doing? Why are you going and doing modeling, DJing, starting a business, building a podcast, doing a YouTube channel, whatever it might be. And I don't know why. I mean, we've got a much bigger population density than you guys. So we're just crammed in a lot closer together. You know, there's a lot more people in a smaller space than there is in the US. Perhaps that's part of it. Perhaps it's the fact that the weather is a little bit crap. So people always focus on social issues because there isn't actually that much to do. This is a real serious influence on people's time because when you don't have leisure activities that are given to you freely by nature, you actually just focus on more rivalrous games. We're an older country. We're thousands of years old. People are embedded in the places that you live. There's nowhere up and coming in the UK. Austin's up and coming and Miami's up and coming. And even this last 16 months in America, we've seen the stocks of particular cities rise and fall. That doesn't happen here. It's very established where people live. So I live in a middle class area of Newcastle. And then that way there's a lower class area and that way there's a whatever area. And you're talking within a mile, half a mile. And there's these boundaries. Oh, well, the council houses are over there, but the mansions are over that side. Maybe even on the same street, but just at different ends of the street. But everybody knows it. It's very interesting. In terms of how you fix it, I really don't know. I try to give as good of an example as I can of someone that's just doing what he wants to do. But I was at the mercy, and still am, almost 9% of me is still at the mercy of my programming. But for a long time, I was 100% at the mercy of it, like just completely being pulled along by the wind. So I see why people get caught up like that. And this is why you get these guys that'll drink every weekend, weekend warriors, party guys until 40 years old, 45 years old, 50 years old, still living for the weekend, still can't wait for Dave Stag do in Vegas this year, stuff like that. It makes me sad. It's the worst thing about the UK, the rigidness of the class system. There's not a lot of process assortative mating. So you don't have, because people just don't mingle. You don't mix. Everything you've just said about the 
class system in the UK stands true for India as well. How so? It's right from the moment you're born. You're born either in the upper class or in the lower class, and then it gets into the education, whether you're highly educated or lowly educated, and then gets into the, when you start doing a job, it then transcends into how much you're earning. So that class system, right from the family that you're born in into the very end of your late career, it's still intact, a very huge part of your identity in India. Well, think about that. One of the reasons that people feel uncomfortable about a class system is that it's a obvious representation of where somebody was born in life. But what were we talking about at the start? IQ is exactly the same thing. It's bestowed on you. I mean, at least you can get lucky and win the lottery and get out of the... There's no IQ lottery once it's been given to you. Unless you take an appropriately angled blow to the head or something and become a superhuman. I'm not really too sure. You said about learning and sort of how I map all of the different things that I get from my guests. Man, it's so messy. And this is like an ode to everyone that hasn't got their shit together because... I'm friends with buddies like Tiago Forte or David Perel or Ali Abdal, these guys who have a external second brain personal knowledge management system that's completely synchronized on Notion and whatever backs up to the cloud and all this stuff. Tim Ferriss has a concept that he calls the good shit sticks. And that's the one that I follow. That you uh, 350 episodes, or whatever of the show, and the things that come to mind are the memories that by their nature have stuck with me. If the thing that you tell me doesn't affect me sufficiently profoundly for me to remember it, then I probably don't need to remember it. So I kind of allow my memory to be a self-selection mechanism for this stuff. And especially when we've got such a high input of information, everybody now has a surplus of stimulation and content that they can consume. There's two ways to go about it. One is ruthlessly index everything that you can. This will lead to you having an unbelievable insight into the world but it's only for a very specifically sort of built person. And for everyone else, just release the tiller, man. Just let go of it. Just allow the rudder of the ship to steer you wherever you go. The Aubrey Marcus episode that you do ends up with creating a TEDx talk from it two years later. And then maybe you go for 30 episodes and they just make you feel good because you have a nice conversation with someone. They don't profoundly change you. So I just think letting the good shit stick is, that's the way to do it. It reminds me of the line from Zorba the Greek. Zorba is this free spirit, and he's talking to his boss, who is not a free spirit. And Zorba goes to the boss, you lack one thing, boss. And the boss goes, what's that? And Zorba says, you can't cut the rope and be free. When you get into that space, I think that amazing things happen. Back to the class thing for a minute. I view that as actually one of the major positives of the great reshuffle because geography, as far as I'm concerned, no longer matters. And I understand your point of view in your local scene, but Vatsal is now working with me and I have no doubt he will go on to far greater things. But even that, if we go back to where we started in the podcast, that isn't getting transmitted, I don't think, to many of our younger people. I tease people because I like you, by the way. There is one thing that defines me politically, and that is I am fiercely anti-authoritarian. If you ask me my opinions on a variety of other issues, you're going to get confused because you're going to say, wait a minute, if you're in favor of a woman's right to choose, that means you have to believe X, Y, and Z. No, it doesn't. And I thought that was a great part of our conversation. But one of the things that I do to tease younger people is capitalism sucks. Tweet it from my iPhone while getting a Starbucks. <laughs> is that going on in the UK too? I don't see it here as much. We're very much salt of the earth people. Let's get this out there. I have tons of British friends and you are, and that's one of the reasons why. I think that it's made us very resilient to a lot of bad ideas. The press for all that they're trying to do. So here's something, man, here's a really good example of it. It made me really uncomfortable a couple of weeks ago. So England lost the Euros final and in the penalty shootout, some black players missed some penalty kicks and there was some online racism that was directed at them. And I was away in Ibiza and it's just as well because I only spent a tiny bit of time on the internet and even that made me feel very, very uncomfortable for the next few days. So this is why. On one side, you had people who had said despicable things to world champion athletes from their armchair and on the other side you had a press that had decided that this was going to be the headline because oh, we played well but we lost doesn't actually make for a tremendously good limbic hijack so you had 
one group that had done something heinous and terrible and another group that had decided this is going to be our talking point for the next seven days. But even with that, you see people in the UK saying, why are you talking about this? Why are you giving these idiots the attention that they want? Why are you even bringing it up? When you think that there was tens of millions of tweets about this, and I think that they'd managed to find a hundred tweets that had been directed in a racist manner. I mean, that's a hundred more than it would be correct to have. But if you take a sample of a bunch of million people, there's going to be psychopaths and sociopaths and people with learning disabilities. If you get the sample size wide enough, you're going to get one of everything. Monkeys on a typewriter writing racist stuff in the ether. That really highlighted to me that British people kicked back against the press, overtly trying to push a disintegrative narrative that they wanted to have this. We've always known that this is the way that England's been. It's like, is it? Is it really? Because none of my friends are like that. And no one that I ever know is like that. And I've met a million people on the front door of nightclubs and maybe seen three racist things ever. Maybe observation selection effect. But that was one thing. We're resilient to bad ideas. Progressive pushed sort of wokey bad ideas. Here's another reason it's not cosmopolitan enough. No one's coming to Newcastle upon Tyne to import their bad ideas from somewhere else to stage a march. So the threshold, the same as the good shit sticks, the serious shit enacts. So we had BLM protests last year, but we haven't had some of the other less well populated protests. Whereas in the US, somebody trips over a brick, there's the opportunity for crowds in the street. So we're resilient in that way. And again, this is the tall poppy thing. It's the advantage that you can't be anything that you want to be or that people tell you to kind of calm down because it acts as a control mechanism for people going in. I don't think that we've quite found the right balance, but it definitely helps in these situations. I'm fascinated by cultures around the world and how they form up in terms of things we're talking about right now. So one of the things that I find happened more in America because of the hypomanic edge. And there was a book written about it by a Wall Street Journal editor in the late 70s or early 80s. It was his lamentation, essentially, that what had happened in America was that because of the fluidity of our society, like was marrying like, i.e., really smart people were marrying other really smart people. And if you know anything about genetics, that means that they're going to probably have really smart kids. And one of his first points that I still think about, because I don't know, and I want your opinion here. He said, for a long time in America, we rejected the idea of class because America. But he said, if you looked at how things actually worked, you could have a brilliant baker and an idiot banker. And they stayed the banker and they stayed the baker. And then that started changing dramatically in the late 20th century. What do you think? So a sortative mating is when you have people that are similar phenotypes sleep with other people and they mate up. And this is something that Robert Plowman, the guy that wrote Blueprint that I had on my show last week, who really, really red pilled me on behavioral genetics, what he was talking about, that Silicon Valley is becoming this now, that you have this Matthew principle occurring that these super geniuses are mating with other super geniuses. And as you start to pull that out further and further and further away, you're going to create these sort of weird insular little communities. It's strange because I got accused of promoting eugenics when I talked about behavioral genetics, because you're like, well, what do you think other people judge their a partner's attractiveness based on? What do you think fitness signals and beauty signals are? Good hair, good teeth, good nails. A symmetrical face is genetically harder to grow than a non-symmetrical face. Women that have feminine features are statistically more fertile than women that don't. Men who have more masculine features are statistically more fertile than men that don't. They have higher tests, so on and so forth, all the way down. So again, it's uncomfortable, but there's only so far that you can force people's preferences in this situation. There's a couple of things that I've noticed over the last couple of years that capitalism will always win and desire will always win. So there's a few boundaries where the impetus of a crowd to make a forcing function to try and match their preconceived idea of how the world should be, where it stops dead. And a few of those occur with desires either for mating or desires for products 
as well. So for instance, you saw on Love Island, which is the reality TV show that I went on that's recently come out, on that show, they are trying to diversify the cast. And on there, people's desires cannot be pushed around. You are statistically more likely to be attracted to people of your own race. That's fairly uncontroversial, but it's kind of awkward when there's maybe only two black people on the show and it's kind of expected that they get together and then they do because that's seen to be kind of reinforcing these dating stereotypes that you get. But you're like, well, hang on a second. Do you want these people to date someone that they're not attracted to? And the same thing goes for, to continue the reality TV analogy, why haven't we got a gay version of Love Island? Why aren't we representing all different types of sexual preference on there? And you go, well, okay, so you need two gay people at least, or else it's just going to be one person in the corner, which is going to be weird. And then you'd need to represent two lesbians as well, presumably, because that would make it equal. And then you go, well, okay, well, there's a big trans community and then there's a big bi community and you can just continue to slice and dice until you're like, right, okay, well, in order to represent everyone that you want to, and the argument would be, okay, well, why don't you create a show that goes and does that? If you think that that's what the market wants, then you can go and do it. And if the market does want it, then it will be rewarded. But again, in that situation, no matter how you want the world to be, desire commercially, and sexually will kind of always butt up against that. It's like an immutable truth. People don't really seem to want to complain about that because they're like, well, we know that this is the case. And you see it happening here in the US, in Hollywood. People who watch award shows plummeting, no one's interested. The movies they put out for the most part, unless they're for kids, plummeting, nobody's interested. I was talking to a good friend of mine who's a director and I'm like, what's going on? Clearly the market is telling you something here. The market is telling you this is shit. <laughs> We're not interested in this. There's so much richness out there. Do you really see them saying, nope, we're going to stick with this. We're going to keep putting these shows out and fuck you. You're going to watch them. I can't see how that's going to work, man. Capitalism is a hell of a drug and the market will win out. The market will always win out and we can't force people's preferences into a box. If you decide that sleeves in shirts is oppressive all of a sudden, let's just pick the most arbitrary thing that you can, but no one wants to wear ponchos, you go, well, I can't believe, look at all of these people that aren't supporting this new virtuous movement that we've got. I'm not generalizing everything here. Obviously I'm trivializing it for the people from Twitter that are listening. But the fact of the matter is our desires come from a very, very base place, base in all of the terms. And you can't play around with that. And when people's bottom lines really, really start to get squeezed, they're going to go, I mean, I was listening to Bill Burr the other day. So was I. Very synchronicity right, moment there. <laughs> he said, if you're going to fucking destroy the country, at least give us some good films to watch. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> if you think about the Oscars, man, think about what's won Oscars and awards over the last few years. What was the last one? Was it like maybe one of the Batman films that was an absolute super stonker blockbuster commercial success that maybe did well there? That'll be up there. But you think, come on. And then if you do get something that's kind of interesting, like Joker, it gets lauded with all sorts of awful terminology. I don't know, man. Here's an interesting one for you. So here's another lesson that I learned from um, somewhere that I probably wasn't expecting to. Do you know Ryan Long? He's a comedian. He does this sort of very incisive cultural commentary online. So he did the racist versus anti-racist, how racists and anti-racists basically agree on everything. <laughs> he did a video about that. I actually have seen that. I didn't know the name. It was really funny. <laughs> it went hyper viral. So that was him. And he came on a couple of weeks ago. He's a similar age to me. He's maybe a couple of years older than me, but he's a cool guy. So he was in a ska punk band when he was 18 in Canada. And then he's been doing stand up since then. And he's got a nose ray. He's like infinitely more cool than I'll ever be. He has his finger on the absolute bleeding edge of the pulse of the internet. He really gets it the same way that Tim Dillon does. Tim Dillon is working three years ahead of everybody else, pretty much everybody else on the internet. The lesson that I learned from Ryan Long is that if you look close enough at the internet, at the real cutting edge of the culture, you can predict things that are going to happen one, two, three years out from that. So some interesting examples would be Dan Bilzerian. So if you actually look at the real cutting edge guys that do commentary on YouTube and stuff like that, they were making critical videos around Dan Bilzerian about two years ago. 
And then maybe about sort of 18 months ago, you see people like Philion and Tom Nash, who are these sort of young people commentators. Tom Nash does finance analysis on YouTube. And they're saying, mm, something doesn't really work out here. And now most people on the internet think that Dan Bilzerian's a man child. He's not got the Hugh Hefner thing. He got rumbled for not owning that house on the top of Hollywood Hills. He actually was renting it. The finances in his company have gone backward. How did you lose money when the entire industry increased by 20% in the year of 2020? All this sort of stuff. Brian Rose from London Real, two and a bit years ago, you start to see these sort of rumblings in the odd corners of the internet. Dave Rubin, at the moment, I think is an inflection point, a hockey stick inflection point, where if he continues to take the wrong sort of a turn that he may sell his integrity so hard that he can't buy it back. It's everywhere. You need to listen very, very carefully. And this is what I learned from Ryan, that first off, if you do sell your integrity, you can't buy it back. There's no amount of hustle that can outwork being uncool. And once you go down that line, you are done. And especially when, if you've got personal accountability and a brand that's attached to you and you've taken the Naval thing, but you didn't get the cool memo. If you didn't decide to try and stay cool and relevant and stress test people's ideas, because the internet's grift radar, the chill alert is so hyper-tuned that if you're not careful, your own audience will come for you. Perfect example, look at the fighter and the kid, Brendan Schaub and Brian Callen. Their own subreddit has been hijacked by people that troll them. Same as Dave Rubens. And you're like, oh my God, this is supposed to be for you. And now this is a collection of people who go out of their way to make incredibly smart, funny jokes about you. And because people are mimetic creatures, let's say that your mind hasn't, you've stumbled upon something of Brendan Schaub's and you say, I wonder if I like Brendan Schaub, I'm going to go on Reddit. And you find that everybody else thinks that he's a waste man. You go, oh, well, maybe, yeah, I always knew he was because the mimesis is strong. We saw this with GB News. So the UK started a center, a news station, independently owned, started by a lot of people from all over the world. It was accused of being the UK's answer to Fox News, but I don't think that was quite a fair characterization. But there's certainly some right-leaning voices on there. That being said, when the Overton windows shifted so far left that anything center seems far right, it kind of makes sense. And the worst piece of information that could have been put out about them was some viewing figures from a couple of weeks ago that said that the viewing figures were low. And I thought, even though watching the news is by its very definition, a transactional solitary affair, no one wants to watch the news station that nobody else watches. Don't sell your integrity. You can never buy it back. You can't out hustle being uncool. Could not agree more. It's like when I give advice to younger people, especially is be your authentic self because you don't have to try. I did a podcast with Tom. He's actually a very nice young guy. He's a little promotional with Bitcoin. He plays the game. He wanted to have me on the podcast because I will always and frequently say, I don't know. And it's one of these things that really annoys me in that, again, we're back to human nature here. It is human nature to want to pay more attention to the person who seems certain than to pay attention to the person who is like, certainty is only for madmen. What do you think? I mean, does that play out? Is that part of this underlying biological soup that is kind of there and we're not going to change the ingredients? Fluency and precision of speech definitely gets conflated with truthfulness. This is how con men get away with it. They have a sexy sales pitch and they flog some insurance that your grandma doesn't need for thousand dollar a month repeating payment or something like that yeah it's a difficult one man because although there is a lot of nuance in the world the rubber has to meet the road at some point and you have to actually commit to to a decision and i think that what i try and do is essentialize a lot of the concepts that some of the bigger picture guests that i have on talk about so daniel schmachtenberg is this huge galaxy brain guy who legitimately is from a different species and my sole goal is to try and wrangle him down and think, right, okay, like I need to concretize this. Like you have to say something that I can understand and that the audience can understand. So yeah, part of it is people being seduced by a sense of orderliness because the world's chaotic. And if I tell you that I've got the answer or that the answer is far simpler than you think it is, why would someone want to have to understand nutrition and sleep and training to be able to get lean? Why can't they just take a pill? because it's a more orderly, easier solution to it. Our brains are built for those sorts of pathways. I mean, there's a lot of certainty in religion. 
And we spoke about something that I see you regularly repost about on the episode you did on my show called Conceptual Inertia, which is the previous intellectual frameworks that underpin the way that we see the world. They linger long after those actual institutions have gone away. And you think about the way that we still see the world now, that was that came out of a conversation about existential risk, that as soon as you go from a geocentric to a heliocentric view of the solar system, even though it's been absolutely proven, this sort of cultural behemoth gets dragged along behind like a dog that doesn't want to go for a walk. And I'm wondering whether the certainty that came out of religion maybe play, you know, you can attest to a higher power, you have a small number of gatekeepers that are your window between you and the divine, that's the person that's able to give you the information, that's the priest or the preacher or the vicar or whatever. I'm wondering how much that plays through. There's all sorts of reasons for it, man. I mean, it's probably just limbic hijack again, but that's definitely an element to it. Our last episode featured the religion with no name, which is fantastic. You keep digging, keep digging, keep digging, keep digging. What you find is they all start as marketing campaigns. Our gods are better than these gods. And here's why, which is maybe why the early Christians borrowed at least allegedly, psychedelic beer from the cult of Dionysus to get people switched on. But that gets me back to the whole idea of when you fuck with people's beliefs, that is a very, very dangerous thing to do. And so I have tried many, many different ways to put things. Hypothesis, thesis, bets. I think bets works, right? If you're going to be like, you had a guy in the UK, I can't remember his name, but he was making these apocalyptic projections in the independent about COVID. And he was off by power laws. And I had a conversation with a friend and it was simply like, we should just make him put money on it. And guess what's going to happen? Oh, you and I totally agree on this. You've got to have skin in the game because if you don't, you can say anything. Here's a really good one for you, man. So I learned this while watching Sam Harris. So this is not a lesson I've learned from someone who's been on the podcast, but someone that hopefully at some point in the future will be on. I watched that piece. I loved it, by the way. So basically the suggestion was that you can put skin in the game by paying a social cost to hold the view that you do. So audience capture is something that every creator and every viewer as well should be really, really concerned about that if you say left things, then people from the left will start to love you more as long as you continue to say left things, which forces you to say more left things, which da 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 da, da, da And then you go down a complete rabbit hole. And the same goes for the right as well. Or the same goes for any position that you want to hold, whether it's anarchy or libertarianism. I'm talking politics at the moment because that's what everybody seems to want to talk about. But the same could be true for transhumanism. The same could be true for biohacking or longevity or CrossFit over powerlifting or bodybuilding over weightlifting, whatever it might be. You get captured by the audience. The reason that I really respect Sam Harris and the reason that I trust that he's a good actor is he pays an incredibly high price for every view that he holds because it's so multipolar, it's so multivariate, it's so non-typical and it pisses off every episode I imagine pisses off at least 30% to 20% of his audience. He's incredibly anti-Trump, incredibly pro-vaccine, incredibly pro-lockdown and mask measures, but also very anti-woke, very pro-personal sovereignty. And you think like, where the fuck is this guy getting it from? And you go, well, he's getting it from his own personal values. You can put skin in the game by showing that you are prepared to, you don't need to die on your hill, but you do need to not fold at the first sign of pressure. And this is what Sam does really, really well. I trust that Sam believes the things that he believes because the price for him believing them is so high that nobody that didn't believe them would do it. That's it. And again, I've been pitching this book so hard, but The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch, he does an amazing job of explaining this idea that we can't prophesize about knowledge that hasn't been created yet. And it's our natural default to be all Club of Rome doom. So Ma Malthus is a great example. W was he using data that was absolutely correct? Yes, he was. Was he missing data that was not present because it hadn't been invented yet? Yes, he was. So this idea and default to pessimism 
is another one of the things that's kind of baked into the human DNA. I find it so refreshing why I love you, for example, because I don't know what I'm going to get when I'm watching your podcast, which I love. You demonstrate, again, distinctiveness. You demonstrate every time I watch or listen, I'm kind of excited. Because I don't know what you're going to say, which I think is great. And I just wish that more people could be much more comfortable with that. It takes a lot of work, man. It does. It takes an awful lot of work. It would be nice if everyone was 8% body fat with a six pack. <laughs> it takes a lot of grafts to do all of these things. And I understand it's a lifelong pursuit. Here's another thing. So I think I've got two lessons left for you. So one of them is actually from Jed McKenna. So this is from someone that I went on a podcast with, which is you that you forced me to get and it's release the tiller. So I've got it written on my board over there. So for the people that don't know sailing, the tiller is the thing that's attached to the top of the rudder. It's basically the steering wheel of the boat. And Jed implores us to release the tiller. He says that most of the suffering that we encounter in life comes from gripping it too hard and trying to force our way through the current. And I only found this out after speaking to a sailor recently, but it turns out that this analogy actually maps onto sailing itself as well. That if you try and force against the waves, the ship can actually steer itself through waves better than you can because its tiller will allow itself to move and that's the most efficient way to go through it. This has been a lesson that I've learned from a ton of different people. Most of them have done something to do with embodiment. So yoga guests that I've had on or people to do with meditation, especially the behavioral genetics stuff as well, that there is so much sort of embodied knowledge and understanding and wisdom that you have that you do not have access to. And for those of us that pray at the altar of cognitive horsepower and love to be cerebral and love to understand the world and have a real fascination with human nature, we can think that, well, if I just learn more, know more, have a better personal knowledge management system, if I just update my notion page a little bit more efficiently, then I will be able to wrangle the world from chaos into order in the way that I want. And that is not the way that it works. It's never been the way that it works. There is so much embodied knowledge inside of you. The reason that you cross the street when you see someone that just looks a little bit shifty on there, the reason that you naturally feel warm and associated and familiar with someone new at work that ends up being a really good person and the reason that you don't with the person that ends up cheating on his missus in six months time because you knew that there was something up with that guy. And if I said, if I held a gun to your head and said, what's going on, you wouldn't know, but you knew something in you knew you know when you're feeling a little bit off. You can sense it in your body two days before the illness actually manifests itself. Whatever it might be, myriad of these situations, there is embodied wisdom inside of us. And this isn't woo-woo stuff. This is the way that your system works. And one of the things I need to remember a lot is to release that tiller. It's written on the board over there for me to remind myself every time I walk in and out of my room that I don't need to take things so very seriously. That what would this be like if life was fun? That trying to control all of the different outcomes isn't going to happen and that it's going to happen anyway. The things that are going to happen are going to happen. Imagine how much work people have put into trying to change their IQs, not knowing that only 20% of it was even under their control by the end of their life. It would be like finding out that most people spent most of their life trying to become taller. It's liberating. It's uncomfortable because you think, well, I want to control the direction that I'm going in. I want to be a sovereign individual. There is nothing unsovereign about allowing your nature to take you forward at all. That's something that's taken time for me to realize, right? You have this sort of Hegelian vacillation between a desire to let go of everything and a desire to control everything. And now I'm trying to come back down to just be like, look, utilize what you've got, but allow the rest of it, allow your programming and your sort of embodiment to take the rest of it and carry it forward. My mom would call that being comfortable in your own skin. I learned so much from her. And again, just a learning that is amazing. If you have the unconditional love of one parent, it doesn't need to be both. It's best when it's both. But if you have the unconditional love of one parent, the imprinting that goes on there, it carries you through the rest of your life. Every night, I say thank you just to the universe, basically, because I won the cosmic lottery. So did you. So did Vatzel. Anyone who's actually here, do you know what the odds against us being here and being conscious? Did you end up watching my TEDx talk? Did you ever see that? I started it and I haven't finished it. I started it last night. Okay. There's a number for this. It's one in 10 to the power of 2,685,000. So it's a one with 2,685,000 zeros after it. So that number is not just larger than all the particles in the universe. 
it's larger than all the particles in the universe if each particle was another universe. That's how big that number is. It's basically unbelievable. The chance of you existing is zero. If only there was a way to get the anchoring bias to work on that figure, you could spend 90 years in horrific crucifying pain and still feel blessed. Exactly. Well, and Tony DeMello, when he had his Satori and became enlightened, interesting guy because he was Indian like Batzel, but he was a Jesuit priest, which is an odd combination. But he was in Calcutta and the rickshaw driver was clearly ill and dying. Yet he seemed to DeMello to be such the idea of a free soul. Rutowski talks about it. I love that quote. So he noticed this, right? And so he asks him, how much do you make a day? And he tells him, I can't remember what it was, just a tiny amount of money. And so DeMello goes, will you take the rest of the day off and talk to me? Of course, I'll pay you. And literally in that moment, when he started talking about his life and one of the things that he mentioned to DeMello is, yeah, I'm dying, but I got to live. And DeMello had never kind of put it that way in his own brain before. But that brings me to another thing I wanted to talk to you about, because it's really fascinating for me, because I've come to you always as kind of this thinker, this intellectual who puts out really, really good stuff. But tell me about your nightclub. I arrived at uni at 18, and I'd spent all of my money in Freshers' Week, drinking and partying, which is the week before inductions begin. And I sat down next to this guy in my first ever seminar, and I said, I'm skint. And he said, oh, well, if you come with me, I work, used to work for this company in Leeds and I'm going to go and get like a flyering job, like giving out flyers for a nightclub. Dude, I'll do anything. I'm like completely skint. I went with him and that guy now, 16 years later, is still my business partner. It's that guy that I sat next to. We've been business partners. I was groomsman at his wedding and christenings and all this sort of stuff. We just started, I was a professional party boy. I was good at giving out flyers. I was aggressive with what I did. I treated it like a professional as opposed to someone that just loved getting drunk and had realized they could monetize it. And then I got my first franchise at 19. It's an event called Carnage, which people from the UK, everyone from the UK that's over the age of sort of 28 will remember. It was this big t-shirt bar crawl and you had to wear a t-shirt and you ticked off tasks on the back, like pull a pig or kiss three randoms or t went upside down in a whatever. Like we used to do that and that got me through uni, then finished uni, went on to do a master's and started up a weekly events company. The entire events business is fascinating because what you're weaponizing is mimesis. And I never knew it at the time. Club promoters know it inherently, even if they don't have a name for it. So typical tactic amongst club promoters is to hold the queue at the front door upon opening so you can get an insane queue shot and post it online. Well, what's that? The queue is what people try to avoid, but why are you posting it? Look at all of these other people that are coming. You should come as well. The insight into human nature is endlessly fascinating because you see people at their least encumbered. The collective effervescence is so strong that the DJ can tell them to sit on the floor, they'll sit on the floor. The DJ can tell them to do a handstand, they'll do a handstand. They're just so in the moment. It's a great vehicle to make money. I did very well out of it for a long time. It's paid for the property portfolio that I now look after, which I absolutely love. That was a really cool pivot that I made. It shaped me profoundly as a person, but there are a lot of externalities that people don't see coming out of that industry. It's a very much a cowboy sort of place to work. The industry is very, very cutthroat. No one has anything contractually obliged. It's just constant anxiety. Think of a more fickle industry than nightlife. If somebody brings out a bad iPhone on the next one, the 13th iPhone's bad, the 14th iPhone will still sell a ton. But you can go from having a 100 grand, 200 grand a year event to it being shut within three weeks because someone's opened a slightly cooler one a couple of blocks away. And this led to, again, a very particular sort of worldview around business, around marketing. One of the main lessons that I took from it actually is how much anticipatory pleasure people take. And this is such a hack for any of the entrepreneurs that are listening or someone wants to start up anything, anything at all, you can artificially increase the popularity of the thing that you're going to do by drawing out the amount of time from when you announce it until when you do it and then opening up the fourth wall of the process as you go. So for instance, with us, let's say we've got a new event coming and it's going to launch in September when the, the students come back. We will, in a couple of weeks time, in the middle of August, will something new is coming, some really dramatic cinematic, like over the top cinematic 
video and get people talking. And then maybe we'll spread some rumors around about where it might be, but none of them will be right. We'll accidentally leak a WhatsApp message in one place or another, and it gets people talking. Or maybe we'll say that we're going to move an event to somewhere else. And the more that you can try and just build people up, I've done this with the lead magnets for my mailing list. So my new lead magnet, which is a hundred books to read before you die, I'm going to do a full one week teaser campaign of here's one, but maybe a book a day or whatever. And there'll be a reminder that you can set on your Instagram. The humans are such teleological beings that their desire to look forward to something is so compulsive. And anyone that wants to launch anything, my single piece of advice to you would be build out a launch sequence six weeks out and just plan it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this and then I'm going to announce where it's going to be and I'm going to announce when it's going to happen. And then we'll release a logo and then we'll release a branding and maybe it's a restaurant and we'll release some photos of the food or maybe we'll release sort of a dark and black and white photo where people can't really see where it is and blah, blah, blah. Most people don't have that much going on. And creating some drama around this, it signals, I really care about this business. Look at all of the effort I'm putting in. It signals you should care about this business. This is something to look forward to. You should book your table. You should get your spot at the new gym. Someone's opening a new gym or starting a new PT business or something like that. Get people excited about the thing that you're going to release. And it is incredible how powerful this tactic is. I got shut down from ConvertKit when I launched my mailing list last year because they thought that the only way that someone could be driving this much traffic to a brand new, complete zero newsletter list was if there was some sort of hack going on they just killed the account and I had to email them and say, look, I've actually done this. Like it's just kind of like latent leverage, I suppose. And then I've released it all in one day. It's amazing. It's a really, really fascinating industry to be in. And I very much appreciate what I've learned from it, but the late nights, they kill me now. I'm a little bit more advisory than I used to be. <laughs> yeah. One finds that I used to have to go out with one of the rituals on wall street is whoever your biggest broker doing your institutional trades are. They take you out to these like ridiculously fancy dinners where there's lots of wine. And I had to tag out. I was just like, no, <laughs> I can't do that anymore. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. Can we move the table forward by three hours? Is that an yeah, option? Exactly, exactly. And you know, it's funny. I agree entirely about the pre-releasing and building excitement. When my book, What Works on Wall Street was coming out without asking for permission, I always prefer to ask for forgiveness. I walked it down to Barron's, which at the time was the financial newspaper here in the US. And I gave it to a guy by the name of Andrew Barry. And he's like, this is amazing. I'm gonna write an article. And I'm like, knock yourself out. The problem was the book hadn't been released and it had, and it wouldn't be released for five weeks. The story came out. I made a bet with one of my coworkers how quickly the phone was going to ring. I took under five minutes and I won. And it was the publisher and my editor screaming at me at the top of their lungs. You have no idea how book publishing works. That you did that is, we don't think we're going to recover. We're not going to recover because there are no books, idiot. <laughs> you can have the books for them to go buy them. And I went, I'll make a bet with you. And they're like, what? And I said, you don't get it. Barron's is the imperator. If Barron says that you should read something, people are going to keep going. And what's going to happen is you're going to get more orders because people are going to walk in to the bookstore back when we had bookstores and say, hey, do you have this book, What Works on Wall Street? And that's exactly what happened. So it's really interesting that it seems counterintuitive, but it really, really does work. I find it interesting the way it extends to a lot of different endeavors. Vatsal, you have been incredibly patient. So I want to bring you in here. I bet you've got a good question. I just wanted to ask about your podcast, Chris, Modern Wisdom. We've had, we have about 350 guests now. How do you get so many amazing Diverse guests. I'm very persistent and quite annoying on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> That's how I got my job. <laughs> Precisely the same way as you, man. I'm good at networking. That's what I did for my entire life. That's what I know. I know how to network. That's what club promoters do. 
porting that across, it is a superpower. Like it is an unfair advantage. The number of contacts that you can make, it's a sort of a mindset. Once you've monetized your friends and your connections and their friends and who does he know and where does that know? And once you've got into that, it's almost impossible to switch it off. And it's really, really powerful. That's a good thing. I've got some good friends. Like I'm really good friends with Michaela Peterson. Uh, I'm good friends with Jim. I'm good friends with other people. And after a while, you see this Matthew principle play out in podcasting as well, because the circles that people move in, somebody sees someone that's good on a podcast and I reach out to a buddy and say, hey man, can you intro me to Andrew Huberman or whatever? Because he's crushing it at the moment. Perfect example of this. So Andrew Huberman, I reached out to him via a friend. The guy that looks after Andrew's podcast bookings said, sorry, he's a little bit busy at the moment. He can come on in, in a few months time. However, I've got this guy called Rich Davini created the Navy SEAL mind gym. He was like in SEAL Team 6. He's like this super hardcore guy. Do you want to have him on? And I was like, well, this is like a double win. Not only do I get to further ingratiate myself with the team from Andrew Huberman, but I've managed to pick up another guest of this absolute monster I didn't even know existed all through just networking. Being a club promoter, working on the streets or being what's called a street PR, almost entirely eviscerates any fear of rejection when it comes to proposing things to people. And when you go onto the internet, you're like, dude, why would I be scared about someone saying no to me over email? I've been knocked back by 10,000 people trying to get them to come into a nightclub on a cold, rainy Tuesday night in the middle of Newcastle. But it's just networking, dude. A lot of it's down to that. Obviously, I think people like the show, which is great. And you need a sort of a minimum entry requirement to get through the door. But if you just keep on sort of banging away and being in good faith as well and respecting people's time, here's what I want from you. Can you do it? This is why you should do it. Let me know. Like a four sentence invite. That's it. Yeah, I was just wondering what advice would you give to people who just don't get networking inherently? Let's say they're on the introvert side of the spectrum. They're just born with it, genetically speaking, as we were talking about in the beginning of our discussion. Are they supposed to like forcefully change themselves because this is what works and they can't really do much? I think that you can play the game, but know that it's not about the game. Believing that you need motivation to do a thing that you really want to do is a bit of a misnomer. So an example would be, imagine two different girls. One of them spends all day obsessing about the fact that she needs to go to the gym later on. And she's worried, oh, am I, how am I going to go? I might not go. Spends a lunch break, getting all anxious, thinking about it. Finally, at the end of work, drags herself into the car and goes, right, I'm going to go to the gym, gets to the gym and puts her stuff on and trains. There's no difference between her and another girl that just goes to the gym. Adding in this extra degree of freedom around motivation being needed doesn't really matter. If it makes you feel better, write out the message that you need to send to someone or even write out the script. If you're a PR that needs to work on the street and you're an introvert, just write the script out and then say, okay, so that's what I'm going to say. And the person that I say it to is completely irrelevant. There is no anything. It's just, this is what I'm going to say. The fact that there happens to be a person in front of me makes no difference. And I'm aware like, you can ratchet this up. One of the things that people are most scared about is public speaking or going up and cold approaching a girl solo in a bar or something like that. These are the things of nightmares, but you can work around it. Be prepared, know what you're going to say, respect this person's time and have faith like nothing's going to go wrong. And this is where the evolutionary mismatch comes in. We feel like giving a talk on stage or in front of a work group of 10 people in a conference room feels like being chased down by a tiger because rejection by the tribe 50,000 years ago would have meant death. If we'd stood up and said something that lowered our status so low that we couldn't get any children, then we're kicked out. But just observing that emotion arise inside of you, your neck feels hot, your shoulders start to come up. There's sort of a ringing in your ears. You can feel your cheeks are starting to flush and your palms are starting to sweat and you're all tense. And you just open gaze, notice your peripherals, slow breaths through your nose. And you think it's fine. I live a better life than any hunter gatherer in all of history. I have absolutely nothing to worry about. Even if I lose my job, nothing's going to go wrong here. And just that transcending your programming through remembering that the stakes are nowhere near as high as you think they are and that the blessing you have of being on this planet is much greater than you realize it. There you go. You're unbeatable. You're literally invincible. You're immune to anything. Talk about an end quote, man. I love that. And I will attest to Chris's ability to share. He's always the first to DM me or text me and say, hey, you got to have this guy on. And I'm going to after watching them. And so I do appreciate that. And I hope I'll be able to get used. You should probably have Tim Urban on. Have you had him on? No, no, no. I'm a big fan. He's amazing. You and he, I would wait with bated breath for that conversation.
I'll swap you Tim for one of mine. You can tell me one that you need and I'll swap you Tim. Done and done. All right. So we always end these, which I really don't want to do. This has been so much fun by asking our guests that we are going to make you the emperor of the world. You can't kill anyone. You can't put anybody in a camp. But what you can do is you can incept people where you're going to incept two ideas into the population. And they're going to wake up the next day thinking it was their own idea. And they're going to start doing that. What have you got for me? I would say have faith that their passion and their curiosity is going to lead them forward. So lead with that first. Stop wrangling the environment and the world and what they think should happen to fit some preconceived idea of what they want to happen. So release the tiller, I suppose. And then potentially the other side of this, that would maybe be broadly 50% of the population. And then the other 50% of the population would be hopefully aided by just questioning the beliefs that they hold at a fundamental level. As far as I can see, the choice in life is becoming aware of the mental afflictions that you have and the discomfort that's associated with that or the discomfort of being ruled by them. So those are the two choices. Those are outstanding. I'm always fascinated by the answers that I get from people because these are the kind I love because these are universals that your second point is something that I bang on about endlessly and the first for that matter. Listen, man, I'm going to have you back on. <laughs> I didn't even get to have my notes. <laughs> you amaze me and delight me. You are an amazing guy. So thank you very much for being on the pod and we'll have you back on again. Boys, thank you so much for having me. Cheers. Cheers.